so great to see you. I am so excited, so thrilled to be able to be with you this morning and preach and lead on the topic that we're going to be talking about. We're wrapping up a four-week sermon series on Proverbs about word to the wise. So if you haven't been with us for three weeks or this is your very first time here, this is a completely standalone sermon on wisdom and on Proverbs. Whatever the case, we are glad that you're here. Our topic that we're going to be jumping into is all about friendships and the people that we invite into our life and the people's lives we invite ourselves or we are in and a part of. And when I think about friendship, I go to one of my favorite Proverbs, and this really kind of sums up a lot about what we're going to be talking about. Proverbs 12, 26 says, a righteous man is cautious in friendship, but the way of the wicked lead them astray. So our word to the wise for this weekend is just the words, use caution. Now I'm excited about this sermon for a couple of reasons. Very first, the reason is this is a worship together weekend. So this is one of the two times of a year, two times a year where all of our elementary students and all of our middle school students are in service with us. And when I was given the topic about friendships and using caution for who we invite into our life, I was thrilled because who better to hear that message than an elementary student or a middle school student? I was very excited it wasn't on marriage or on, or on retirement or whatever that looked like. It was great. I'm like, yes, I'm excited about this. And here's the other reality is that for you and for me, it doesn't matter if we are five years old or 50 years old, we need to hear these words. The second reason I'm so excited about this is because when Pastor Chris gave me that topic, I jumped in. I found out about this about four weeks ago, and I dove in head first. And there is so much information, there is so much to learn and glean from Scripture about friends that we choose and the relationships that we have. And so I started reading, I started looking at Proverbs, I started researching, I started getting into different devotions, and I read sermons and watched devotions and watched sermons. I started watching some kids' object lessons. If you ever need something to do for entertainment value, watch some kids' object lessons because for every 20 bad ones, there's one good one. And there's a lot of them out there and it provided me and some of our uh, children's team some, uh, a break of entertainment to watch some of the things. And needless to say, none of them are gonna make it into uh, our time today. I also read an entire book. For me, that is an accomplishment. Very exciting, and I want to clarify what that means. I listened to an audio book. <laughs> I, had, I was confronted last night by a few people and said, did you actually read that book? For me, I say I read a book that was same, that seven hours, and we're going to reference that throughout the message uh, today, a lot of great, great stuff. And so even through that process... It brought such a new level of respect for me for the other Pastor Chris. I had four weeks to do that, and I don't feel like I'm adequately prepared to deliver this message. He has to do that each and every week and doesn't get the luxury of four weeks to prepare. Yet here, here we are. We're going to look at a variety of different texts today. We're going to look at a lot of different Proverbs. But before we jump into that... I want to overlay what we're going to be talking about from another text. We're not going to look at this verse by verse, but I want this to kind of serve as a template for friendships and relationships that we have. And we're going to reference back a few different times, and especially when we get to the end of our message, when we really dig into using caution to make the choice of who we want to invite into our circle, we're going to really look a little deeper at that. We're going to look at one of my favorite passages, and actually my favorite text in the whole Bible is right after that. But I want to start with the book of Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to look at the first four verses. So, like we do each and every week, as we begin, I'm going to invite you to stand if you're willing and able, and we're going to read that. I'm going to read that for you. It says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, 
being one in spirit and purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only at your own interests, but at the interests of others. There it is, you can be seated. We always ask God to bless the hearing and the reading of his word. Now we're not gonna weigh everything that we're gonna talk about against this text, but we will be back. We wanna look at a few truths from scripture as it, as it pertains to friendships and the relationships that we have. And the very first one is the origin of friendship. And I know that very sentence may be a little bit confusing. What do you mean the origin of friendship? Friendship is just there, it's part of life. But I wanna say it this way and to help clarify, and I'm actually gonna say it twice. We were created from community and for community. Let me say that again. We were created from community and for community. The story of us, the story of mankind, the story of all of us in this room are an overflow of a relationship. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Long before the story of redemption, long before creation, there was community. And we were created out of that community for friendship. We were created for friendship with God. We were created for relationship with God. And we were also created for friendship and community with others. Here are some verses to show you what I'm talking about. In Genesis chapter two, verse 20, after the creation of the first man, Adam, it says, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. He was created for community. In 1 Corinthians chapter one, verse nine, says God who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. We were created for community. This next passage, for some of us, is gonna be very familiar. For some of us, this might be the first time you've ever read this text. A lot of times when we reference Acts chapter two, starting at verse 42, we talk all about church, and we use it in reference to maybe even the service or this community right here in this room, but I want you to hear these words through the lens, through a different lens. Look at it and, and read this and hear this through the lens of your own circle and your own community, the people that are in your life, and maybe it's gonna read a little bit different. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled in awe at the many signs and wonders performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We were created for relationships. These are just a few verses that outline that need for community and others. But I wanna pause just for a moment and I wanna, I wanna look through the lens of culture. And here's the reason I feel like we need to do that. Because depending on where we are, depending on what our history is, a sermon or a message on friendships and relationships is going to look entirely different based on our history and based on our culture and based on what we are accustomed to. For example, in the United States, a message on friendship is gonna look different than it would in other parts of the world. There are a lot of things I love. I love the United States. I love our country. I love our freedoms. I love that all of the independence we have. But here's the reality of some of the downside that comes with independence. The very word itself means we don't have to depend on anyone else. And independence, parts of that push us into the lack of a need or lack of a perceived need for relationship with other people and the lack of need to depend on other people and have, have friendships. In many other cultures and countries, community defines life. 
I read story after story, country after country, community after community of people that depend on each other. When other people who aren't blood relatives help raise kids together, families that depend on each other for for things that they need for life for every day. And so their community is their life and is their, their family, is their circle, is their friends. We live in a time and it's happening right in front of us where we are being pushed, we are being moved into isolation, we are being moved away from relationships and encounters with other people. It's happening in my life, it's happening in your life. See if you resonate with any of these examples. I remember a time when we used to borrow things from other people. We used to need an egg, we used to need sugar, we used to need a tool to fix something. We'd go over to a neighbor, we'd call somebody. Now what do we do? We just go buy it ourselves. Or we decide to make something else that doesn't require that ingredient. We used, to, we used to go outside more. I feel like a lot of times we just stay inside. And it's not always because of the weather. Sometimes it's because, you know, if I go outside, there's a good chance I'm going to run into another person and have to talk to them. We used to rely on people to help us fix things whether it be electrical, plumbing, something with our car, we would call somebody up and they would come over and they would help us and we could grow in that relationship and that friendship. Today, we just look it up on YouTube because it has all the answers. And then when we try to fix it, we break it more and we call somebody and they have to pay. We have to pay for them to fix what we've broken and done worse damage to. Remember that day and age when we had to leave the house to buy 100% of the things we needed? Those were the days. Now we just buy everything online. Folks, we are built for community. We were created for relationships. We were created for friendships, to grow in our faith, to grow in our relationship with Jesus, yet we are pushed away. This brings us to our second truth that I found from scripture is that Jesus really modeled spiritual friendships for us. And I know all throughout scripture, there are a lot of different principles that can apply to the relationships we have. And there is a lot of great stuff that Jesus did that we can apply to our life. But I wanna look through the lens about the people that were directly in Jesus' life and what can we learn from that with the friendships he had. The first thing I wanna look at is Jesus prayed about his friends. Sure, Jesus prayed for his friends a lot, prayed for the people in his life a lot, but the most important word I wanna look at in that sentence as it applies to you and me is that word about. Jesus prayed about the people that he wanted to have inside his circle, the people that he wanted to spend his time with, his life, his ministry with. In the book of Luke, chapter six, verses 12 through 13, it says, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he designated as apostles. He prayed about who he was gonna invite in to his circle. The next thing we learn about from Jesus is that he challenged his friends to live a life of obedience. John chapter 15, starting at verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me but I chose you and I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my Father's name, the Father will give you, and this is my command, is to love one another. He challenged his friends to live a life of faith, a life of obedience, a life that will bear fruit, fruit that will last. The third thing is Jesus, and this is gonna seem very obvious, he chose his friends. It wasn't an accident, it didn't just happen. He picked who he was going to invite in to his life. This next sentence might sound a little bit controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway and then I'll unpack it. Not everyone who wanted to be close to Jesus was given that access. 
Not everyone who was wanted to be close to Jesus was given that access. Out of the multitudes of people who followed him, there was a group of about 70 that were with him. Out of that 70, he chose 12. Out of that 12, he identified three that he was gonna pour his life, pour his ministry into. The other people in the life of Jesus had access to him only during brief moments of their lives. If we are going to be fruitful for the kingdom of God, we cannot, and you already know this, you live it out, you realize this, we can't spend all of our time with everyone that we meet. We'll dig into that in a few moments. And the last thing I want to look at as it pertains to Jesus' example is his friends were those who stood by him during the difficult times, during the trials of his life. Luke chapter 22 said, you have stood by me during trials. I confer on you the kingdom just as my father conferred on to me. We need to seek out people and we need to be a people who have relationships that are there for each other when things don't go great. We need to be that type of friend and we need to look for those type of friendships. When it comes to friendships and relationships that we have, chances are you fall in one of two categories. You may be the person on one side who feels like you don't have enough friends. You have a clear deficiency, a relationship deficiency, and you don't have enough people in your life. You might be on the other side where you feel like you have too many friends. And by that, I mean three months go by, six months go by, and you're like, oh, I haven't called so-and-so haven't connected with so-and-so. I am a terrible, terrible person. And then you start to realize you have too many people in your life to manage. Research has taught us a lot about relational capacity. Relational capacity is a fancy way of saying, how many people can you manage in your life? For example, on Facebook, I looked up, how many friends do I have? I wanted a true gauge of how many friends I have. So of course I went to social media. I have about 1,250 friends in my life. Needless to say, I don't know all 1,250 of those individuals. Might have been somebody I just had a brief encounter with, might be a friend of a friend, whatever that looks like. That's too many people to manage in my life. And so your outer level, your outer uh, group of friends, that's basically gonna be your Christmas list who you send a Christmas card to. My Facebook friends, I do not send a Christmas card to all 1,250 people on my list. If I'm being real honest, I don't send it to anyone on my list. I haven't sent Christmas cards out in about 20 years, but that's beside the point. We have a relational capacity. In our life, we can manage about 150 people. About 150 people in our life. These are our friends, these are the the outer level, the outer circle that we have. I had conversation with a lot of different people throughout the research and digging into this about friendships. I had some of my single friends tell me that whatever number you come up with, you should probably cut that number in half because of the relational disparity of being single and having relationships or friendships with married couples and the difficulties that it is, and I totally recognize that. Whatever that number is for you, there is a relational capacity that we have. Within that 150 people or whatever your number is, you can manage, we can manage about 50 acquaintances. Our acquaintances are starting to get into people that we really know. We know about their life, we know about their family, we know about their kids, we know about their jobs, we know about their experiences. It might be a coworker, a relative, a neighbor, somebody around us that we spend a lot of time with. Within that 50 acquaintances, we can manage about 15 people for our village. These are our people. These are the people that we do life with. We talk to them all the time. We've been over to their house. They've been over to our house. We've went out with them. We've done things. We know all the details of their life, our people. It's our village. I did an audit of my village, and I came up with 14 people that are in my village. So I'm taking applications (laughs) for number 15. If you have a swimming pool, maybe you wanna serve as a small group leader in kids ministry, whatever that is, I'm taking applications. I've set up an online form. 
I'll send you the link. Within your village of about 15 people, you can manage three to five BFFs or your best friend forever. You know who these people are. They are your first call. They are the first layer, the first person you think of when you wanna hang out, the first person you wanna talk to when you have great news, the first person you wanna call when you're going through a difficult time or trial or sorrow or hardship. Three to five people, that's about it. These are just general averages, but it should paint a picture for you about your own relational and friendship capacity. If you remember back to Jesus, he had 70, then he had 12, and then he had three. The next truth that I wanna look at is being a good friend. I really wrestled with this one, and I almost combined it with our next point, our next truth was to talk about choosing good friends, but I didn't. We're gonna treat these as two different truths because each of them carry a significant weight of importance. The scripture and Bible tells us a lot about both of these. And I also feel like before we can choose our friends, choose our circles wisely, we have to do the work ourselves and make sure we are a good friend. Over the next truth, The next two, being a good friend and choosing good friends, many of the scriptures that we're gonna look at are interchangeable. For example, one of my favorite Proverbs on friendship is Proverbs 18, 24. It says, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So from that, we can do two different things. We can apply it to our life, and you don't want someone in your life that is unreliable because it could cause you ruin. And likewise, you don't want to be unreliable because it can cause someone else ruin. That's just one of the examples. I wanna share real quickly some very practical things that you can do to build and you can use to break or bust a friendship. We're gonna start with a couple of things that we can do that will bust a friendship. Have unclear expectations gossip about your friends, betray their confidence, be possessive of your friends, be controlling or smothering, be competitive or jump in the negative comparison game with your friends. In that book that I read slash listened to, which I still count as reading, Jenny Allen writes a book called Find Your People. My wife suggested this to me. She's like, you have to read this book. You have to, and ironically, it's all about girl or female relationships, female friendships with each other. Yet my wife said, Chris, you need to listen to this. But it's fantastic and amazing. I would recommend anyone read that about a biblical perspective of the relationships and friendships we have. She writes it this way when you're talking about things to bust a friendship. Wait for your friends to call you. Be easily offended. Have a lot of opinions about your friends. Don't share your hurts. Remember and don't move on from a friend's mistake. I don't know about each of you, but a lot of those cut deep for me throughout my years and the friendships I've had and I, can, and I have. Maybe you feel a deep level of conviction on the relationships you have. Let's flip the coin about some ways that we can do to build friendships, but before we do, I wanna look at a few of the Proverbs that can help us and guide us, and I wanna do this through a couple of different translations, because I looked at a lot of different of the Proverbs, and there were some of the translations that we got that really spoke to me, and maybe they'll speak to you as well. From the New International Version, Proverbs 16, 24, pleasant words are like honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and healing to the bones. From the New Living Translation, Proverbs 27, nine, the heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. From the New Century Version, whenever you are able, do good to people who need help. From the New American Standard, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. I have a brother and I can relate to that. A brother is born for adversity, but a true friend loves at all times. And the last one I wanna look at is from the message. I don't typically look at the message or use the message. It has a lot of different, kind of what I would would indicate as a loose translation of things, but I love the way this one is written. In fact, I made motions for this and I'm not going to ask you to all do them with me, but there's three motions that go with this verse. 
and I'm gonna read it. Overlook an offense and bond a friendship. Fasten on to a slight and goodbye friend. How practical is that? If you overlook an offense with the relationships and the friends that are in our circle, you can bond a friendship and grow it together. But if you hold on to something and you hold on to something that's happened to you, it's as good as saying goodbye, friendship. What a picture it is. Here are some very general and practical ways to build a friendship. Be knowing and caring for your friends. Initiate with your friends. Cultivate and do the work with your friends. Be a safeguard. Jenny Allen writes it this way in her book. Ask deep questions. Listen, then speak. Tell your friends what you are grateful for in them. Talk with your friends about Jesus. Do fun stuff together. There are many, many others on both lists for both categories, but I wanna jump into our final truth on our study on friendship, and this is where we really use wisdom, and we really have to apply what we learn, and it's choose good friends. This is where caution and wisdom come full circle. There are many relationships we have that we don't get to choose. Our outer circle, for example, might be someone we're related to. We don't choose who we're related to. It might be somebody we live next to or work with. We don't often have the opportunity to choose those relationships. But as you get deeper and your circles get tighter and closer in the people you're gonna spend your life and your time with, you have the ability to choose. You can choose your village. You can choose your BFFs. You can choose the people that you pour into. And if you've heard nothing else I've said this morning, Hear these two words when it comes to that. Use caution. Use caution for who you invite in. Andy Stanley, a well-known pastor at a church in Atlanta, says it this way. It's your friends that determine your direction and quality of life. It's your friends that determine your direction and quality of life. Another author says it this way. Show me your friends and I will show you your future. Show me your friends, and I will show you your future. Proverbs says it this way, Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Proverbs 18, 24. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 16, 28 from the New Living Translation. A troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Gossip separates the best of friends. As a parent, I remember the early days of our boys and their friendships. In the younger years, it was just that outer circle. It was people they happened to live by or went to preschool with, or maybe even their cousins. But as they grew, their layers deepened and expanded. And as that happened, we as parents become more and more nervous, more and more protective. And we started to be, take caution for who they invited into their circle. And I don't know about you, but for Lisa and I, we had that list. It might have been a mental list. I don't believe we had a, ever wrote that down. But a list of those, those kids that we were cautious, that were like, please, don't pick them for your circle because we lived out this or we looked at, the, at Proverbs 13, 20, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. We were cautious for them. Parents, if you're a parent, I, I can imagine each and every one of you at some point in your life have wrestled with that for your own children about who they've invited into their circle. If you've never had wrestled with that and never had a list, your kid might have been on our list. Just kidding. But maybe not, who knows. It's often in our life, our deepest regret, our darkest shame, our worst decisions come out of the friendships that we have or the people that we surround ourselves with. Our first drink, our first cigarette, our first time with drugs, our first time shoplifting, our first sexual moral failure, 
our first whatever it is, and you fill in the blank. It's likely it had a lot to do with the people who were in your circle. Research has also shown us that when you spend a significant amount of time with someone, your brain waves begin to match and mirror each other. In other words, they begin to think, act, and behave like each other. And as a parent, we recognize this, and I feel like that's why we wanted to use so much caution for who was invited in. Almost without exception, when one of our boys invites someone into their circle, whether it be a girlfriend or a close friend, one of the first questions we ask them, not directly to the, the, the individual, but to our boys, is this question. Do they love Jesus? That's our first question. And we totally recognize and understand that just if they said yes, that doesn't mean everything is gonna be great, but let me be honest with you, it's a great foundation. It is a great start for people in your circle. So what do we need to look for when we're choosing our circles? If you remember back to Philippians chapter two, here are some of the things that can keep, that can get us rolling. Have compassion. Look for people who love people. Look for people who are compassionate about people and are genuinely love others. Being of one spirit and purpose. Find people who love Jesus with you. That is a great person to invite into your circle. Don't be selfish. Don't invite people in who are selfish. Don't be vain. Don't surround yourself with people who love the world and love the things of the world. Be humble. Invite people in who think of others more than themselves. This is a friendship list that I can get behind. As we wrap up our time together, I wanna focus just for a moment on that second one from that list of being of one spirit and purpose. And I wanna do this through my own lens and my own experience about inviting people in. The majority of my village, the majority of my BFF list is from this church. It's from right here. In the 19 years that our family has lived in Greenwood, Indiana, we love a lot of things about central Indiana. We love the beautiful weather, we love all of the different things, but at the top of the list is definitely Mount Pleasant Christian Church. Because at, in our relationships, my relationship, my boys' relationships, my wife's, Lisa, her friendships, our family's friendships have been and continued to be one of life-giving and one spirit and one purpose. And we are so grateful for that. I met with our senior, senior boys small group about a week and a half ago. Now I love to do, I love this opportunity. I'm so grateful I had that opportunity for a lot of reasons. One of them was that I saw a lot of those boys grow up in the church and they've been here since, since the time they were born. And we, we just got a chance to hang out together and meet and we talked about a lot of the things that we're talking about today. Because who better to hear this message than a graduating senior who's about to go off into college or whatever's next in their life. And we had a great time sharing and, and I gathered a few of them and I got a few of the high school senior girls and I asked them this question. I said, what is your favorite thing about the friendships you've made in your high school small group here at Mount Pleasant through the years. Here were some of their answers. I met my best friend and my future college roommate from this group. It's great to be with girls that love Jesus and love each other. We count on each other. These are faith grounded friendships. Small group has changed my life. The group stays close and has created a strong bond. We all come from different backgrounds, but we unite with our love for Jesus. We can open up to each other and share the details of our life with each other. We have real trust, real conversations, real faith, and real friendships. I bet when we started, you didn't know this was gonna be a sermon on high school small groups. But here we are. If you're a parent of a middle school student and a high school student, 
I cannot encourage you strong enough to get them involved in a small group here to help shape the circles that they live in, to help shape their village, to help shape and create their inner circle. One of the boys from that group, from the high school senior group, and I won't tell you his name, but we recognize something a little bit special in him. We see something amazing and unique, and I actually had the chance to baptize him a few years back. He is an amazing leader, he is an amazing kid, and he's the type of person that we would love to have in our own boy's life in their village or as a BFF. And long before I heard about this sermon or the topic, we asked him a question. We're like, what makes you so awesome? What makes you the way that you are? And his answer was, it was his high school small group that did so. What a testimony of choosing your friends wisely and the importance of using caution for who you invite into your circles. I wanna close with a very simple outline and a practical takeaway from scripture about choosing wisely for your own friendships. The first one, choose carefully. The process matters. If you remember back to the very first proverb we looked at said, a righteous man is cautious in friendship. The process matters. Choose wisdom. Their influence matters. From Proverbs 13, 20, walk with the wise and become wise. Choose reliability. Dependability matters. One who is unreliable, friends soon come to ruin. Choose calm. Their temperament matters. From Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24, Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. And the last one, choose integrity. Character matters. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. My challenge to you, my challenge to me, whatever your age, whatever your season, Choose well, choose wisely, and use caution because the influence that we have and the influence that others can have on us is very significant and can make an eternal impact for the kingdom.